But when you're not anxious, you're able to clear-headedly enter into a problem and say, how can I be of a solution here? Because my body's alarms aren't screaming, get out of here, get out of here, or go fight, or go fight, or go fight. Oh, my friend, welcome back. What's up, man? <laughs> it's so good to see your face. It is better to see your face, dude. It's great to talk to you. How you doing? You. Yeah, likewise. How you doing? We are rocking and rolling, man. Thursday, we're ready to kick it. Well, listen, I'm just glad you're here again. I don't know how many times this is with you on the podcast, but never enough. You're, you're poor listeners, you're man. I appreciate it. No, man, it's so good. But here's the thing. Of all the conversations I think we've ever had here on the show, and aside from just our friendship off the air and hopping on the phone, um, I'm so ready to have this one with you because, as you know, this has been one of the hardest seasons of my life. And... The people I coach and the listeners here have emailed me crazy in crazy fashion to say, where did this come from? I've never experienced anxiety and pain like this in years. <clears throat> anxiety is running full tilt. As you know, it has been in my life. Anxiety is in the problem, though. That's right. Just take it from here. Yeah, what's the problem? Yeah, I think um, I think it's good to go back and just say, ask the question, like, what's anxiety? And yeah, right. it's just, we're told that anxiety is a disease. We're told anxiety is a genetic disorder. We're told that anxiety is a, a broken human that somebody has got to come rescue. And, um, I, I ultimately reject that. I don't, I don't think that's true. I think anxiety is simply our body trying to get our attention to let us know we're not safe. We're out of community or we're not healthy. And so in that way, as, as, Dr. Wendy Suzuki says she calls anxiety a friend, right? It, it's something that it actually, like, I don't want to live in a house without without a smoke detector, right? I don't want my house to burn down while I'm asleep, and it, the detector never lets me know. Um, but also, I don't want to live in a house where the detect the, the the alarm's going off 24/7, 365, because um, I'm continuing to light fires, or I'm continuing to let other people light fires in my house, or I'm continuing to live in a house that has faulty wiring. And so um, I think we have created a world that our bodies can't live in, Chris. And then we've let the world call us crazy because we can't keep it all up. And um, I, I'm just at a point now where I can't can't continue to look myself in the mirror and be honest and, and let people continue to be disempowered as our culture has disempowered them. And so that was this book. This book was a love, a letter to myself, it was a letter to my kids, and it was a letter to my neighbor saying, hey, um, we don't have to play this game anymore. Yeah, let's stay on disempowerment. I want to know why and what what are the tentacles of disempowerment? What do they look like? And maybe it's related to this because you just said we've created a world our bodies can't exist in. What do you mean by all that? I mean, uh, our bodies were designed for seasons of cold and seasons of hot. And our bodies were designed of seasons of plenty and seasons of not plenty. And our bodies were designed mm. to carry heavy things. Mm. And our bodies were designed to move all day. And um, in an effort to make things predictable, which I love, and to make things, um, hey, we can count on tomorrow being similar to today. And hey, instead of starving for a season and a whole bunch of people passing away, what if we just ship in apples from Guatemala and we ship in avocados from wherever and uh, we can solve for food. And instead of not having any water, we can just pump it miles and miles and miles away. So we've solved for all these issues. And at the same time, our bodies weren't designed to have all these issues solved. And so we've we've created a world where if you miss one, if you're five minutes late to one meeting, your whole day falls over and your whole week falls over and your whole life falls over. We've created bank accounts that, man, if you say the wrong thing at work and you get fired, they take your house, and they take your cars because you, none of us own anything. We borrow money to, to lean up against stuff that we use and, and on and on and on. So we've created a world that our bodies just can't exist in. And then we have a bunch of charlatans, and I'll even go as far as to say a bunch of people who are really well-meaning, really trying hard to, to help, tell us, well, if you feel this way, it's because you aren't working right, and I can fix it through my supplements, through my this, through my special program, through my whatever. And um, yeah, it's just whatever. So when it comes to disempowerment, there's a lot of money to be made by – making you feel like you're less than, and I can solve it for you. There is a lot of power to be gained by rounding people up and saying, hey, 
um, this happened to you, you're always going to be less than unless I come rescue you. Um, join me. And so, mm. and let's find an enemy, and our enemy is them. It's whoever them happens to be. You feel uncomfortable, it's because of them. And so we've just created a culture that's so opposed to discomfort in any shape, form, or fashion, even great discomfort, um, that uh, we've lived these unintentional lives. And when you live unintentional lives, man, people will hook their their money-making schemes to us, and then all of a sudden you find that you are not in the driver's seat of your own life. Yeah, so is it like, are we, or have we created unintentionally these borrowed lives because of the not only financial debt, but relationship deficits in our lives and our emotional unhealth? Like, are we living, to extend the metaphor, like borrowed lives so much so that, that those borrowed lives then um, create this world that is unable to sustain how we were designed. I love you said that. Can I tell you, it's a, it was a crazy moment for me. I took, I remember taking my wife, we went to, on a date to see um, La La Land. And I loved the movie. It was great. The ending was sad, which, but it was perfect. Oh, I loved it. The actors were great. Ryan Gosling um, and I, we look almost identical, mostly on our upper bodies. We're almost exactly the same. <laughs> Let's go. Not at all. Let's go. <laughs> Not even close. Uh, all the actors were everyone. I think was great, but I remember walking out of the movie, and, and if, for those of you who haven't seen it, there's a lot of scenes in jazz clubs where there's some really extravagant dancing and piano playing, people laughing, having fun. And I remember holding my hand, my, my wife's hand, as we walked out of the theater through the parking lot, and I remember thinking, "Huh, I just paid thirty five dollars for two actors in Hollywood." to spend an evening in jazz clubs and dance and enjoy themselves for my entertainment. And I thought, I could have just spent 35 bucks and taken my wife dancing. And so when you say that, yeah, I outsourced that evening. And what I also outsourced was movement. I didn't have to sweat. I outsourced all of the vulnerability because I'm a terrible dancer. Um, I outsourced the, I don't know where to park at the downtown jazz club. Like I outsourced all of that discomfort to... How about I just pay these two people who are more beautiful than I could ever dream to be, of being? What if I just give them money and they can have the date for me? And so – or when it comes to food, I'm not going to grow my own food. Why would I do that? You grow it, and I'll just come buy it out of your box. I'm not going to hunt my own food. I'll buy it. You do that. You do all the dirty work, and I'll just eat it um, in a nice round shape. Right? We outsourced everything, and I think our frontal lobes know that's an excellent move. Very cool. This, is, this works out for us. I think it's our amygdalas and the memory parts of our brain that are screaming at us, hey, we're not safe, we're not safe, we're not safe, we're not safe. And that's, that's, that's yeah, I think we've completely outsourced everything. Yeah, let's stay here. I hadn't thought about that. Okay, if we're outsourcing everything, outsourcing relationships, vulnerability, um, risk, outsourcing um, discomfort, as you said, I think about Michael Easter's book, The yeah, Comfort Crisis. Yeah. Masterpiece. Uh, Oh my gosh, yeah, and I know he endorsed your new book, which is so cool. Yeah. Um, what happens when we outsource, and what are we, what other things are we outsourcing that we don't know we are outsourcing, thus unintentionally catalyzing the internal crisis that is just lighting flames upon our nervous well, systems? I mean, what happens, uh, COVID's a great idea. I mean, it's a great, not a great idea, it's a great example. The supply chain. We just quit making stuff. Oh, they're going to make it. Cool. And then we ran out of cars, man. Like we ran out of wood like because we outsourced it all. And so there is something about partnering and working with your community. Everybody can't be an island of to themselves. But I think the economists who started speaking up saying we've been saying this for years, man. If you get rid of all manufacturing, you get rid of all production, you get rid of all these things, there's going to come a day when they go, eh, we're not doing that. Um, and so I think it I think it creates a sideways mess. And when your body knows, hey, the power just went out, and I don't know how to turn that back on. Hey, uh, the grocery store was out of milk today. I don't know what to do. I, or when you need groceries, like it happened to me when I was a kid, and the bank said, there is no more dollars right. in that account. And my dad, yeah. I remember that look on his face. Um, man, your body knows. Your body knows. I think the big outsource that we don't talk about much, and this is I don't we don't talk about this in faith communities, and we don't talk about this, and I'm I'm being generic faith communities, any of them, 
and we don't talk about this enough in the scientific community um, where I spent a long, a lot of time is I think we have outsourced God, the idea that we are have to be in submission to something bigger than ourselves. And when you do that, when you clip the tether, when you clip that line, when you don't have to walk outside of your tent or your hut and look up to the sky and say, God, whoever, God's God, whatever, please reign or my family dies. When you don't have to do that anymore, you just turn on a faucet. It's real easy Whoa. to think you're God. That I pay my water bill and that's my water. Dude, somebody built that pipe and pumped it way far away. And so I think over time, really, and not over time, really quick, we have cut the strings to any sort of cultural narrative around, hey, all of us are in the same story. And everyone said, no, I get my own story. I get my own truth. I get my own narrative. And when you do that, you end up worshiping yourself. And then you start worshiping how you feel. And then when you don't feel good, you start asking other people to bend their lives to get – so you see, and now we – boom, this is where our culture is. And so um, I don't know a path forward for a non-anxious life without, without knowing I have to submit to something bigger than myself. So how is outsourcing life, outsourcing God, how is it neutering uh, the perseverance, the muscles of perseverance and endurance and grit, the ability to just move through pain, not avoid it. And I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, how, how is this willingness to outsource all these things atrophying our ability to cope with life? I love that you you phrase the question that way because I think that we have done a poor job with things like resilience and courage and yeah. bravery. I don't think those are things that you have or don't have. I think those are jump shots and free throws. I think those are skills that you practice. You practice resilience. When people say, how do I get more confident? Well, do some things that you can be successful in. And then your body goes, oh, we know that. Um, and so I think when you look at those things as skills and then you look at um, our classrooms that are drill and kill, you know, like, right? They're algebra questions and you do worksheets. And then my son was watching Khan Academy videos in his school. And I remember think I said to him yesterday, dude, I don't want to pay taxes to have you go to school and pay somebody to tell you to turn on a TV and do something that you could do right here in my living room for free. And then I'm paying a babysitter. I'm not paying a teacher, right? But we've created a world where we don't teach those skills anymore. And if you don't have to do those things on a regular basis, like you, you use perfect word, that those muscles atrophy. I don't have to be resilient. You have to stop saying things that hurt my feelings. I don't have to um, lift heavy things. I just push a button on my cell phone and food just shows up at my front door. And so I don't have to do, oh, you don't, I don't have to have a messy conversation in my church. I'm going to the other one because there's a million of them on every corner. And so I don't have to go through any of these challenges the problem is your mom's still going to get sick. The problem is your husband's still going to leave you. And life will – the storms will come. And if you don't have the muscles, if, you're, if you've let everything atrophy, there's, there's, there's nothing to hold you when, when the storm comes. Friendship. Friendship is a skill that we just let atrophy. Sitting there and not being annoying when somebody's hurting is hard. You have to learn how to do that. Right? All those things. All those things are skills. So if we're atrophying, excuse me, if we're outsourcing all these life skills, when anxiety hits, this is a, a, a loose uh, analogy here, back to the uh, smoke alarm in the house. How are we getting on a ladder and instead of dealing with the source, the fire, a lot of us pull the battery out of the alarm because we're like, that's annoying. That's right. So what, when we, what does that look like and how does that play out? I mean, I think it's just like you said. Avoidance, if, right? If you were to take three or four like um, three or four kids and they were three or four years old and you put them in a house mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you spun up the smoke detector, just that, <laughs> those kids would cry and scream and maybe one of them would throw a ball at the thing to try to get it to shut off, right? If you put three or four adults in there, Hopefully, they would look around and go, whoa, what's on fire? You smell that? Like they would begin to look for where the fire is. And 
that's the difference between someone who's got the skills and someone who doesn't, right? Or the maturity and someone who doesn't. So yeah, if you are living a completely atrophied life, you've outsourced everything, you're just yes. trying to not be uncomfortable is your is your goal. And you are on your couch watching Netflix, watching TV, watching a show that is a, a channel that curates the world to ha- what you want. And the news is clicking up on your phone in a, to give you what you want and to tell you the stories that you want to hear about the, how the world is spinning. And then somebody calls and says, hey, mom's sick. Somebody calls and says, hey, your car just got stolen. Somebody calls and says, hey, your business just closed. And those alarms go off. They don't point you in the right – like you don't have the skill set to go, oh, I need to check out what are those alarms trying to tell me. You just like a toddler start screaming. It's not safe. And so, yeah, the easiest thing to do is to run up and grab a ladder and take the batteries out or to take a baseball bat and smash that thing because the goal then is I want to be comfortable again. And the most comfortable thing I can do is to not have that alarm going, not I want to be alive tomorrow. That's not the goal here. I want to be safe. Safe versus comfortable. That's uh, those are those are two very different experiences. Yes, it is. Yeah. And I think about you know like Wendy Suzuki. Um, she's been on the podcast here. Oh wow, and awesome. We talked all about good anxiety and all that. But so I think about safe versus uh, comfortable through that sort of lens. And I don't want to get too ahead of our conversation here, but I'll just go there for a second. Safe versus comfortable. How do we learn how to discern the difference so that when we're faced with adversity? We, through maturity, pursue, yes, ultimately, we're going to move back to safety, but it, safety doesn't always mean comfortable. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, that's a good question. I, I, I'd have to spend some time pondering that. For me, I don't know that you can have safety in isolation, and I can be comfortable by myself. And so I think that I'm safe when I know my neighbors and I'm safe when I trust my teachers and my doctors and my government. I'm safe when I trust my employer. Um, I'm safe when I trust my wife. I am comfortable when I'm sitting on a nice cushy couch with a pizza in my lap and I got my feet propped up. I'm comfortable when I'm hunting in the woods and I'm in a comfortable tent and it's the rain is gently drizzling, right? I, I, so I can be uncomfortable in isolation, but I don't know that I can ever be fully safe by myself. And that goes against very much against the... Uh, the macho flex culture we have right now. Anything you want to say about that? <laughs> it's because... just it's just a myth. It's dumb. Well, it's just it, silly. It is silly. right. So, well, I talked to um, Nancy Piercy mm-hmm. Monday, and we were talking all about this and the overextension of when we respond and then overextend ourselves. We end up living this hyperbolic world that is, you know, it's not helpful to anybody. No. Anything you want to say about that specific issue? You don't have to. Uh, no, I mean, I, 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 I think that the, I think that's one of the. Um, I'm not one of these guys that thinks social media is the end of of humanity, but I do think it's easy to look. Let me put it this way: it's easy to watch Jocko's clips, and to think that's the life I need to have. And I've that's done I mean. events with Jocko. <laughs> right, that dude has worked 30 years to not be like me. Right, <laughs> he has worked. <laughs> for decades Mm -hmm. to alter how he experiences the world for a particular task. And Mm. um, he also Mm. has deep and profound friendships, people he's literally put himself between a bullet and them, right, And, and vice versa. So to just pick that up and scroll through Instagram and get the crush it, crush it, dude, you're missing so much context there and you're missing so much um, choices and when him and I talked like yeah man I didn't go to all the games I didn't go to all the stuff I was doing this in case this happened and so most of us don't realize that to be X you have to trade for Y and that, I mean it goes back to the book like choose reality man like you gotta like what are you trying to, to do here what are you trying to do here but I think that we can snapshot David Goggins we can snapshot some Cam Haynes some of these guys and um I think it's pretty amazing how they push the human body and the spirit. I think that's amazing. And that's right. They are not going to meet their grandkids because they're that's a short burst kind of life. And it comes with some consequences to it. Yeah. So I think about maybe another aspect of 
living a non-anxious life, building a non-anxious life, would be to get off the hamster wheel that says that the curated life is real life. There you go. I'm just pulling off the example that you shared from when people look at Jocko and go, that's it, or Goggins or whomever, and there is an entire story behind that that is so diverse and so deep and so costly and... And thank uh, God, dude, I thank yeah. God that Jockos exist. Oh, me too. Like, in my yep. bones. And... For sure. I also, as a six foot two, 200 pound Texas mm-hmm. male, had to look in the mirror and go, I will never be that. Mm. So, what am I going to do? Who am I going to be? Like, what's my, what's the path forward for me and my family? And I think it's important uh, for me to delineate that and not say, well, that I'm weak, I'm less than, I'm broken, I'm a failure. No, I've got a different role to play. Everybody's got to play their part. Okay, I love this. You're asking yourself questions, and I want to go right here because I think a lot of people in the anxiety conversation are asking the wrong questions then. You argue this in, in the book. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with my body? When will the chaos stop? When will peace come back? When will stability, flex, flexibility, whatever? When will I get my life back? But you're like, nope, those are the wrong questions. Yeah. Why? Because that's a kid in the back seat yelling at his mom and dad who are driving. When are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? And I want Whoa. people to get back in the driver's seat of their own life. And me go, I don't know, you tell me. When are you going to stop owing people money so your brain can sleep? When are you going to deal with the relational challenges? When are you going to realize your job that you love was gone? And you're going to go do something. Like, when are you, like, you going to make those? Yes, you were, you were born and they kicked you straight to the margins for any number of reasons. It's heartbreaking you can sit at my kitchen table and I'll weep with you. And then I'm going to look you down and say, okay, now what, what do we do next? And so it's, it's again, that's back. That's the empowerment. That's handing people their keys back to their own car, to their own life and say, Hey, hey, you drive. And if you don't know how to drive, awesome. Let's go, let's go to driving school. Let's get some skills, but man, you got to drive and you can't just sit in the back and go, what about, what about, what about when we get there? When we get there, when we get there, um, and that's what I think our culture wants you to do is to get in the backseat of your own life and let somebody else drive because you're too stupid, you're too anxious, you're too depressed, you're too broken. This happened to you one time. You, you suffered this abuse. You, you look like this, and so you're never going to be enough. Get in the backseat, and we'll get you there. And I think that's a lie. I think that's disempowering. I think that's a false narrative. Get in the backseat. So that's the false narrative. I'd like to propose there's probably an identity, a false identity attached to that narrative. Mm-hmm. What what do you think is uh, undergirding, underpinning the narrative itself? How do we hurdle it? In other words, um, we're hitting the target a little bit. Anxiety, number one, is an alarm. Number two, it's not an identity. Mm-hmm. What's underpinning the narrative, the, the false belief? You can't. You can't. It's the same as my daughter and my son are um, because they're they have a good mom. They're nerdy rule followers, and I will ask my daughter like, "Hey, get up in the front seat, let's drive." Occasionally she will, but usually she's like, "No, Dad, I I gotta keep my seatbelt on." And I think, "No, it's cool, man." But it comes from a sense of if I take this seatbelt off, I'm gonna I can get hurt. Not realizing I'm her dad going, dude, I will, my job is to protect you. We're good. We're in the middle of the country. We're just having some fun. And so there's this sense that I think we're told long enough, you can't. Your parents couldn't. Your grandparents couldn't. You, what makes you think you can? We'll save you. And I think we even experienced that um, in, during COVID when 36 million people were told, um, hey, you're an essential worker. Y'all keep going to work. But conversely, 300 million people were told, we don't even need you. Just go home and we'll mail you a check. And I don't think we have reconciled with what that did to the, to the human psyche of Americans. It destroyed people's psychology because all of us want to believe that we matter and we play a role. And we were told, no, you don't. Just go home. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll put some money in your account. We went crazy. We're not designed for that. We're not designed to be Wally. And in doing so, we're back to atrophying skills like resilience, perseverance. Well, we seek it out. And so what is instead of seeking out purpose and through 
service or purpose through achievement or purpose through community connections. We achieved purpose by grenade throwing. We achieved purpose by who we all hate together. We achieved purpose by who we don't associate with. And that, that becomes insidious, right? The greatest gift we gave, could give our neighbors in 2020 was to not bring them food. That is not how we were designed. Right. Interesting. Okay, then connected back to anxiety, then how do we betray ourselves or even just like turn on ourselves in the heat of anxiety? Um, I think anxiety's job is to keep us safe, get us out of a situation. And so I think a lot of that stuff gets automated. And we go back to those, like you and I have talked before, we go back to those core stories and those, those core neural maps that Dang. like, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what kept you safe when you were a kid. And now I'm 38 mm -hmm. years old and this thing happened, I'm coming out swinging mm -hmm. or I'm hiding or I'm going to nuzzle up or I'm just going to lay here. Right. So I think, I think those, I think a lot of that stuff gets automated when we get anxious. And the key is, okay, I feel anxious. I'm going to open my eyes and make sure I'm fully plugged in. What is my body trying to protect me from? What are the things in my life that's out of whack? Uh, what are the choices I've abandoned over the last two months, six months? Where have I, where have I attached my freedom and autonomy to somebody else? And um, where have I started just being reactive everywhere? And I'm going to go look at those sources and try to pull that, that fishing line all the way back to the, to the real, right? I think one of the things I love and respect about you so much is that we, we can pull our conversations, do this, our friendship does this. You did this brilliantly in building a non-anxious life. Um, you pull it down from theory to talking right to, as you said, like the truck driver who is sick to his stomach that he's missing his family again, to the single mom of three who's worried about this, worried about that. Let's just go right there. Talk to the person who's paralyzed like paralyzed in fear and anxiety by change, especially change forced upon them in an unpredictable, gutting way. They're listening right now. What do you say? The first thing I would say is I love you. I'm sorry that happened. And I think it's important to sit there in that for a minute. It's no good. And I think after the appropriate amount of sitting together and sitting in, whew, I think you then say, I know you don't think you can, but I do. I think you can. And I've created a reputation where I don't lie. I'll tell the truth. Even if I've had to do episodes on my show where I come back and say, hey, I screwed up last week. I told somebody this and this about mental health, this mental health diagnostic, and I was wrong. It's actually this. And so I'm not going to lie to you. And I, you can. And uh, when you're ready, I'm all in too. We'll get to the power of connection later because I think it's huge. We touched on it earlier. Um, but here's another person, the person who just isn't sleeping well, who wakes up in the middle of the night with racing thoughts and then somehow they're barely getting a few hours of sleep because they took the five milligrams of melatonin <laughs> and it's just to just to give their, their soul and their body a rest. But then they wake up every single day with a pit of anxiety and fear in their stomach you're sitting with them, but when, when does the next move happen? How do, we, how do we, how does that person get up and then move eventually? I, like, if, what it goes back like? to that identity question we were having. I think the first question you have to ask yourself is, um, do you want to not feel like this? And I don't mean that in a, in a mocking way or a pejorative way. I, I, I mean that in to get up, you might fall down again. And to get up, you might get embarrassed again. And to get up, you might get fired again. To get up, you might whatever. But it, you won't be feeling like this. And so the you know it's the old statement like until the pain of change is you know less than the pain that you're feeling right now, you're not gonna do anything, right? And so um, uh, I think you have to ask somebody, are you are you in? And then we're gonna go through. And I, again, I try to distill these things to out of theories. I try to take all the neuroscience and all the theoretical, all, everything into how can I make this as, as simple as possible for a guy like me? Um, and it was, I'm going to ask you, who's running your life? Who is telling you when you have to be where, what you should be doing, what you have to be doing? Who, um, who do you owe? Who's telling you um, when it comes to boundaries? 
What part of reality are you ignoring? What's the state of your health? Uh, what is the state of your relationships? What's the state of, you know, and we're going to go through those we're going to go through those those stages, man. We're going to go through those choices and add, begin to pull those things apart. And sometimes um, we're, we're, we're recording a, um, a TV show, I guess, is, is probably the easiest way. It's not really a TV show, but it's, it's, it's similar. And as uh, this book came is coming out, um, we put out a call, and I've been walking alongside a guy and his wife for 90 days. And different different um, homework assignments and different challenges, and um, he's had a couple of rough patches, you know, fights with family, fights with this, and it's been almost like a karate kid. Like he's doing wax on, wax off, didn't realize it, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a fight, and those skills are like, oh, that's I, I'm I, I've got these skills I didn't even know I had. Um, but that took him coming to the table saying. I know what's coming is going to be hard, and I know change is a great unknown. But I can't keep doing it like this. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I have these skills I didn't know I have. We'll go back to the uh, the analogy about the body. I I have this muscle I didn't even know was there. But if I tell somebody who's struggling with anxiety, you just need to sleep more. That's not helpful, right? Yeah. So what's what's before? So that when then? I tell somebody, so all right, helpful. cool. Here's what we're gonna do. Yeah. For 30 days, you have to promise you'll take a walk every day. For 30 days. One hour, you're going to set your alarm for 10 p.m., and at 9 p.m., every electronic in your house goes off. The first two or three weeks, it's going to be torture. It's going to be hard because you have to do, you have to, now you have to be a husband for two more hours. Like, I don't, or another hour. Like, I don't know how to do that. Um, for 30 days, the moment you open your eyes and your partner opens their eyes, I want you to hold their hand. And then, right before you leave for work, and right when you get home, and then right before bed, or if you don't have a partner, your pet. I want you just to spend some obnoxious time in a hug with a dog or your cat or your wife or whatever. And we're going to do several things like that. And without even realizing it, you are slowly giving your body a chance. And it will go, it will land the plane if you give it a shot. And that's what I mean. We've created these lives our bodies can't live in. We've created this chaos. <laughs> and then they're like, well, you got, you got anxiety. Well, of course you do, man. Uh, and so I think it's a matter of not saying you should be doing this instead of I want you to try these four things, five things. And let's just do it for 30 days. Don't just do it for three days and go, this doesn't work. Don't just do it until you have your first fight with your mom. Let's just do it for 30 days. And then let's, we're going to add this in 60 days. And then what's going to happen in 90 days, you're going to have a blow up with your spouse. Or you're going to get a really gnarly work day or you and your dad are going to get after it. And you're going to realize, oh, I took – a lot of deep breaths during that fight. And I chose to not say that thing I was about to say. And I'm going to go for a walk right now before I respond. And suddenly you realize, oh, I got it. I got it. There's nothing more insulting to, to a guy or a man or woman who's struggling with anxiety to be told, just chill out. That's the worst, man. Same as if you've got depression. Someone just tells you to cheer up. You just want to set their car on fire and hopefully – presence over platitudes right this is oh, like yeah. how we walk other people through grief and this is why i say so often um that transformation because this is what we're after right transformation is not a life without scars and a life without getting beat up it's it's growing so that we can face life with courage and resilience transformation doesn't happen in a day it happens daily and the, what i hear you saying is like this daily commitment to just show up to make the small steps i mean i know you quoted James Clear in your book and I'm like yeah it's it's the whole thought of 1% better every day and I so subscribe to that because we'll change when the pain of regret and I think this is a hinge moment for us like we'll change when the pain of regret is greater than the pain of making the change in and of itself there right you. yeah I, I <laughs> there's never a day I can brush my teeth so good that I don't have to do it for another two weeks I gotta do it that night I love that I gotta do it tomorrow and so there's never a place I can reach where, dude, my body's not feeling anxious. I'm actually sleeping pretty good. That's not the yeah. day to quit doing the things that got you there. It's a thing you got to do for the rest of your life. And I think there's some freedom. Ah. Um, mm -hmm. Most of us are trying so desperately to get to some magical, imaginary, mythical fin finish line so that we'll finally like ourselves. So that we'll finally have to stop exercising so much. So that we can finally have the greatest crazy sex in our, with our spouse. Whatever. 
Those places don't exist. They don't exist. They're not real. And so if I want to have a car that lasts me a long time, I got to fill up with gas. I got to take care of it. And I got to change oil. And if I want to have breath, it's not terrible and teeth that don't fall out. I got to brush my teeth twice a day. And if I want to, um, if, if I want to have a good um, aesthetic, a good physical body, there's not an exercise, a workout I can do on Monday that I'm done for the month. I got to go again the next day. I got to go again the next day. And so when it comes to living an unanxious life, to living a life of not of peace always, because life's coming at you, but to create a world where I can exist when the storms come and not only exist, but I can thrive. Um, that's just, that's a practice. It's a thing you do every day and it just becomes incorporated into your life. And yes, that might mean that you're not going to do every um, travel sports league and that your nine year old soccer coach isn't going to tell you what you're doing for every weekend for the rest of your life. It might mean that you got to sit down with your spouse and say, Hey, we are not the marriage we had ends today. We got to build something new because it's not working. Like you might have to quit your job that you love, but it's not, t- it's time to go. It might mean a lot of sacrifice, um, but it's a thing you do every day. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk a bunch more about thriving when storms come, because I think the, 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 the first thing we need to establish is the presence of storms is not a matter of if, but when, <laughs> right, right. So thriving when storms come is analogous to building a non-anxious life. Um, yeah, let's go there. What, what else do we need to know about some daily choices that we can make so that we're not avoiding pain, we're walking through it, we're being present with it, but then we're making choices to not live in it. So let me, let me um, this is a, a picture that I painted in the book, one of the, one of the analogies. And this is one that I'm always nervous, in, in this book I kind of went for it, I, I'm always nervous to tell stories about what my life was, I don't mind telling those stories, but what, what it is, is I'm working on now. Um, cause I don't ever want these to be about me, but I also think we've reached a place where there's no pictures anymore. We don't have a picture of what this even looks like. So, uh, 11 years ago, my wife and I sold our house and moved our, me and her and our two year old son into a residence hall with college students, 175 college students. Um, and we began the process of paying off six figures in student loans. We both had doctorates and we both were just in school nerds and we had too much debt. We also had two car notes. We had all kinds of, we just owed everybody everything. And so we started that process and that kept going and that kept going and that kept going. And also about five years ago, my wife started sending an email out in September to our families. Here's what our holiday plans will be. If you all want to join us, great. But we're not going to wait till the week before Thanksgiving and get in a fight via text message on, why aren't you coming? I can't believe you're not coming. But so-and-so is going to be here. Here's what we're doing. Here's what our family's going to be. And kids, y'all get one thing. You get one thing. Or maybe you get one instrument and one athletic thing, and that's that. That is that. And so we, we did that for 10 years. Just slowly built up the muscles, and we got to say no here, and this is hard. I want to actually do this. Whatever. Then my cousin dies. He's 10 years older than me. He was a mess. Um, I, I tell folks he had lived all nine lives and borrowed heavily against the ninth, right? He, mm. he left. He, he had no tread left on the tires. And every time I saw him, 100% of the time I saw him, he'd pull me aside in his awkward non he wouldn't look you in the eyes kind of way and he'd always say i'm so proud of you man keep going you're doing so good and i always meant the world to me that he was seeing me and saying hey you're making different choices than i made and i'm so proud of you and then he dies and here's what a non-anxious life is it didn't prevent somebody i love and care about from passing away but when he passed away i just bought two plane tickets without even looking at my bank account and my wife booked a hotel through her little app without looking. And then she called somebody to watch the kids for two days while we flew to Houston. And on the way, she texted all of our family and said, we're going to eat after the funeral at this place. We'd love for you all to join us. And then they got to be grown up somewhere they joined us or not. And I got the privilege, Chris, of just going to Houston and being really, really sad. That was the gift. That was the non-anxious life. I wasn't there worried about how we were going to get home. We were going to make bills this month. 
whether my kids were going to have groceries when we got home, whether my kids were going to be safe. I got to just go be really sad. And so the non-anxious life is, do you do all these hard things every single day? You lift weights every single day. You work out hard. You go for a run every single day because one day you're going to get out of your car and somebody's going to be kidnapping a kid down the street, right? I've got this, right? You don't owe anybody any money, not for a flex and not to tell anybody. But so you hear your neighbor and they're like, hey, dude, my kid just got kicked out of college and he has anywhere to go. Like, I got him. I, I'll help you out. Um, and it creates this non-anxious life. And so when my cousin died, my anxiety, I was not anxious at all. I was just sad. Um, when when uh, interest rate, not interest rates, when um, inflation got really high, I w- didn't ever get anxious. I got really sad and upset for my neighbors that they were going through this. And so, but when you're not anxious, you're able to clear-headedly enter into a problem and say, how can I be of a solution here? Because my body's alarms aren't screaming, get out of here, get out of here, or go fight, or go fight, or go fight. Then I got to choose. Is this a hill I'm going to die on? How can I be of best service here? Is it yelling and screaming, or is it taking the widows and orphans out the back, right? So that's building a non-anxious life. I mean, that's gold. I think if I can reverse engineer what I heard you say, I'd like to even go to... so. Back to Sheila's initial decisions and, you know, the email she's sending out. Like, what was the immediate effect upon your marriage and then for the kids at home? Your 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 Peace. innermost Peace. circle. Yeah. And some guilt. I had got, mm. done the same thing for Christmas. And mm. as I think it's Brene Brown, I chose guilt over resentment. I chose, right. I felt guilty. I did. I'd rather feel guilty than hate my parents. Right, uh, like just, hey, y'all, but y'all are coming to Christmas. Y'all ain't missing this. Like, and then I'm angry the whole drive. I'm angry all through dinner. I'm angry and frustrated all through. I'm not going to do that to them. They don't deserve that. They deserve the best of their son, and vice versa. I'm not going to model that for my kids. And so, yeah, when you when you when you sit down, me and my wife sit down and say, where are we this season? We're going to be on the back end of a wild book season. A lot of travel. Um, I've got some neat trips that were planned, some hunting trips that were planned. And we decided this year we're going to go make the trip. We're going. We're going to Texas to see the family, which is going to be awesome. But that means we have to, pro- like, prophylactically get upstream and say, okay, it's going to be tough on our marriage financially. It's going to be tough on our marriage just travel-wise and sleep. What can we start putting into place right now so that that's just choosing reality? This is the way this is going to be. We Not getting to the end of all these trips and why are you always like – Man, that's not the time to solve that problem. The time to solve that problem is way upstream. See, this is amazing because as I'm I'm listening to you and um, hearing what's happening and the choices you're making, what I hear you saying in a way is that building a non-anxious life, folks lean in, affords us the power of choice. That's it. Rather, the freedom to not be encumbered by the resentment, the guilt, which goes back to where we started This is what happens when we live borrowed, curated lives instead of holistic, present, centered, mindful lives uh, aimed at living in full truth, in presence, with a value for relationship. Um, And that's transformation, right? That's change. That's change. Not only is it change, it's lasting change. Like this is the change I think you and I have had this this conversation for a while. We both have this vendetta against self-help because we're saying, listen, self, 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 what is it resulting in? Any less anxiety? No. More anxiety because the self can't hold. Correct. The self can't hold the universe. Correct. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay, so what we're really after is change that is lasting and is fruitful. But I'd like to then go back to the uh, the alarm analogy. Could it be then perhaps that the fire that is causing the uh, alarm to go off, the smoke that causes the alarm to go off, is our innate fear of losing control. So we then self-protect, self-promote. Instead of walking through the pain of change, which will bring the thing we're actually after in the in the first place, which is peace. Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely could be. I think that I yeah. think the, that that those fires can be choices I make to continue to eat fourteen, um, yeah. you know, ho hos in the morning for breakfast. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. It can be the 
the number of folks I've talked to who are like, dude, I'm just so anxious. And they're holding a monster energy drink in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other. It's like, bro, <laughs> like, of course you like, you're, you, you, you're in there ringing the alarm with your arms, right? I mean, you're, yes. you're setting them off. Um, and I think That's it's it. disingenuous and not true to not be honest about some people are doing the best they can. And other people keep throwing Molotov cocktails through their front porch, setting their own, their, their living room on fire. And if you work for a boss that treats you like garbage, if you live in a community that won't talk to you because, or treats you subhuman because of the way you look or what you, you know, yeah, your body's going to be trying to keep you safe, right? And so I think it's, I think it's, and it could be, I'm going to try to live this life where I have no, no safety. I mean, where I have no discomfort at all, like you're talking about. I'm going to insulate, 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 insulate. And I think that's the old terrifying truth that when you build a wall, Really, you keep yourself in. It was a buddy of mine that once said, I was trying to figure out a lock and on my front door. Yeah. And he said, uh, you know those locks are for your neighbors, right? And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, front door locks are to keep your neighbors out. If a bad guy wants in your house, he's going to get in your house. And I remember going, oh, <laughs> I don't like that. That was true, right? That was true. Somebody wants to kick my door in. It's not that hard. You just kick the door in. And so – I think I think it's just Boy. waking up to that world. That's the world we're in, man. Insulate, isolate, atrophy. We turn to shame and blame, and then we're back in this vicious cycle the where loops we up. are. Yes. Yeah, we're we're back in the borrowed life. We're back in the the anxious cycle instead of the non anxious life. Now, I hadn't heard this in my life until I learned it from you. Anxiety is a reward based learning system. Man, yeah. I want everyone to hear more about that. That's um that was a neat thing from the great Judd Brewer. Um oh, yeah. But essentially, um if you are anxious, let's say so one of my anxieties back in the day during the stock market collapse was anytime there was a red triangle that was on the ticker tape, just saying that a stock price had gone down. My body would react as though somebody was coming through the door with, a, with an ax. It was wild. It would just, my stomach would drop. My heart would start beating. It was just this physiological response. And so what I did to keep from feeling that way is I quit watching any sort of news always. I would avoid it all the time. And I felt less anxious. And then when I would be at the university and I'd have a meeting over in the College of Business and I'd swing by the huge Wall Street wall and it would have the ticker, my body would whoosh, just mm. drop. My stomach would drop. I'd feel like I'd have to go to the bathroom. My head would hurt. Like It was nuts, man. And here I am with a suit. I'm the dean of students. I'm a chief student affairs officer. Walk to this university having almost a full-blown anxiety attack because of a stock ticker on a wall, right? And the room's full of college kids just throwing stuff at each other and studying or whatever. And that's what the, what Dr. Brewer's work out of his lab, it was so important was if you avoid what you feel anxious about, your body wins. It got exactly what it wanted, which is that thing that it's nervous about to not kill you. It won. And so when it wins, it goes ding, ding. And similar, if you went and bought, if there was five balloons on a car and you told the used car salesman, I drove by and saw those balloons on that car and I just knew I had to have it. I promise you by the end of the week, there'd be balloons on every car because he would say, oh, man, I'm going to make sure I get everybody's attention. When your body realizes, oh, that alarm worked, he avoided it. It's going to sound it louder and it's going to sound it's going to grow. It's going to become more pervasive. And then over time, you get addicted to uh, I think there was some there's some uh, chicken or egg in the literature. And that's that's part of science. And I, I'm not in those arguments, whether. It really wants – your body spins up those alarms because it wants the, the cortisol and the epinephrine or if it spins up those arguments because it wants you to drink or wants you to feel alive by texting that woman you're not married to or it wants you to grab that, that donut or that, that cup, of like cup of coffee, whatever. It wants the, uh, the, the stimulation, the stimulant, the thing you're addicted to. Either way, your body becomes addicted to those alarms and they become more and more powerful. What does that mean? In got regular simple talk for folks like me, the only healing from anxiety is directly through the middle of the storm. You got to head right into it and teach your body. I know you're telling me that's going to kill me. I don't think it is. And most of us can't make that walk by ourselves, especially initially. That's why a counselor walks with us. That's why a couple of good friends walk with us. But I literally 
came to work at Ramsey Solutions. So this isn't theory. This isn't hypothetical. This wasn't years ago. This is three and a half years ago, Chris. Fall 2019, right? I work for a finance company now. There's a lot yeah. of talk about stock market. My body responds zero now because I just had to head straight through it, right? It, my body goes, oh, okay. Um, that's not gonna, the stock market ticker is not going to kill me. And there are situations where every time you pull up into the driveway at work on a Monday morning and you feel so anxious because that boss is so terrible, heading into the storm might not be confronting your boss. Heading into the storm might be, I'm going to apply for another job and I'm going to move. And I like my community. I like my comfort. I like everything about my routine and my life. But I got to head into the storm, which means I got to leave this community. So storm is is less about confrontation and more about what is the path towards healing. And um, it's almost always an uncomfortable path. In a way, what I hear you saying is that avoidance behavior keeps addictive behavior alive. I, I've never heard it said like that. You said what I just said much cleaner. But yes, that's exactly right. right. Hmm. Okay. So that's what addiction is, right? Addiction is wallpaper over disconnection. Oh boy. That's what addiction is. It's, it's a placeholder Uh. for your body screaming at you that you're disconnected (laughs) and it's avoidance. Maybe that is, maybe maybe I have to think on that, but maybe, um, avoidance is another word for addiction. Yeah. I just think because if if pathological avoidance, Pathological avoidance, right? Because then if I think of the innate primeval drive, this is why we write stories and narratives in our heads, right? It's survival. Mm-hmm. And we're just trying to freaking stay alive. Dress rehearsals. Saber tooth tiger. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay, then. So back inside the, inside the uh, narrative then, how do we cut rumination short, especially anxious Rumination, because all that does is for an anxiety anxiety ridden person, it makes their day all the more devastating. Um, I think the most important and powerful thing we need to know about rumination is that it's a complete and utter waste of our time, and it feels like productive, good, helpful thinking, as though we are um, rehearsing any of the negative conversations we could have. Any of we are rehearsing any of the the okay. I'm going to go in there and get fired, but then I'm going to say, you can't do it. And so it's this spinning up, spinning up, spinning up. What I have to know is that's an utter, complete waste of my time, period. If I have a particular conversation that I'm going to go have with my boss, I can rehearse that. That's not rumination. That's practice. But the imaginary conversations, the constant spin-ups, um, that is me choosing to be miserable, That not solve a problem. That is me choosing to be um, – um, like unhealthy. That's a choice. And so what does that look like in real time? Um, I think you and I have talked about this personally, but my wife used to laugh. She doesn't anymore. She's just kind of part of our house, but I'll be walking through the house. I'm a bad ruminator. I'll be walking through the house and I'll literally yell out loud, no, or stop. And I have to put some sort of hurdle in front of myself. Um, or I'll say, I'm not having imaginary conversations today. And I'll say it out loud while I'm driving. I'm just not going to spend my time doing that. I, um, and over time, what, that sounds nuts. And if you're a struggle with rumination, that sounds even, it sounds lofty and woo woo. Well, I promise you is over 10 years, um, I've gained infinitely more control over that. There's still times when I'm super, super tired. I'm super frustrated and I haven't been taking care of myself that it's, mu- I, I will be ruminating for a long time before I catch myself. Um, and there's other times when I'm doing pretty well. And I'm practicing these things and I'm living a whole life that I start to spin it up. And it just two or three minutes in, if Dave Ramsey tells me that I'm going to, oh, whoa, 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 no imaginary conversations today. And it's, it's, it's over. But I also have to backfill it um, with something else. Um, there's a great, jeez, uh, I think it may be Adler. One of the, the fathers of psychology said, I thought that if I took away my client's anxiety and depression, they would be well. What I realized is when I took away their anxiety and depression, they were empty. I have to fill them back with something. I have to give them tools to operate. I can't just take away 
the things that they've been using, the, their operating system, even if it's an unhealthy operating system. So we have to stop the anxiety, but then I got to give you something. I got to give you another way to operate. So if I'm not just sitting there spinning up and spinning up, what I need to do, go spend 10 minutes in front of my computer and type out. Um, if this conversation happens, here's going to be my five talking points and it's out of my head and I'm off. Instead of having 50 imaginary conversations with my wife, I just need to have the courage to go talk to her. And instead of avoiding my kids, I just need to talk to my 13 year old and say, Hey, we can't do this in our house anymore. And I got to deal with the consequences of that conversation, but I got to make those choices. I, I would rather be uncomfortable in real life than win all these mic drop moments in Jeez. my ruminating life. Jeez. What a place to land today. Um, <laughs> honestly, because what I don't want people, you said it, and what you said, folks, if you missed it, rewind 15 seconds. You got to hear that again. What I don't want people to walk away from this or any conversation uh, that you and I have had here on the show is that this is all just about uh, – curating another set of life hacks to move through pain to get back to where we need to be or where we want to be you said that pe personal growth makes a terrible god hit the nail on that head and we'll call this done yeah it, it, it's a it's a perverse and um treadmill track to run on it never ends mm -hmm. um right when you get your the six pack you've taken a bunch of meds for and missed fun birthday parties for and lived in the gym for you turn 35 and your skin starts to sag a little bit and then you go down that road and it, like if you like it's as the great david foster wallace says if you worship beauty you will never be beautiful enough and if you worship money you will never have enough and if you worship anything other than something bigger than you you end up you end up worshiping yourself and that always falls in on itself because we were not designed to hold the center of the universe and so Per, the personal growth for the sake of personal growth is insane. It's dumb. It's a waste of time. I go to the gym in the morning. I went this morning. Chris, I did not want to go. I'm tired. I was on the road yesterday. I'm tired. Um, I didn't feel like it. And I went. You know why? Because I want to be present when my kids show up after school today. And they didn't ask to be a part of this world. I brought them into it. And so I feel like I have an obligation to honor them. And my wife. I said I do. And I believe fidelity is much bigger than who I make out with and who I don't. I think fidelity is I'm all in. And that means I got to do stuff when I don't feel like it. That means I got to do stuff when it's hard. That means I got to do stuff when it's annoying. And so I'm going to develop myself so that I can go be of value and use. Not of value. I think we all have value. But so that I can go be of service to those I love and care about. Um, or as Will Goddard, the great res restaurateur um, in Gosh, New York. I love him. Yeah, he's amazing. But as he says, he tells his wait staff, you cannot walk around with an empty pitcher. You can't fill up anybody's water glass. You've got to go back and fill your pitcher up. And he means that both literally and metaphorically. If you're not well here, don't come in. Because I need you to honor and love these patients, these, I mean, these clients, these patrons who have been on a two-year waiting list. This has to be a magic night for them. And if you and your mom aren't talking, it's, it's, don't be here. It's okay. But you got to fill your stuff up so that you can take care of other people, and I think that's a great, great lesson. And let me like theologically, dude. If Jesus took a break, I God, who do I think I am? <laughs> who do I think I am. You know what I mean? Um, and non theologically, if every six or seven years, um, truly great research professors go on sabbaticals, they got to take a break. Um, who do I think I am? Right? I'm not above it. Building a non-anxious life. Gosh, you're one of my favorite people. I'm so thankful that you took a season of your life to put these words on these pages because I know it cost you a lot. And I just want to say personally as a friend, I love you and I thank you. I mean, this this is a gift. Well, I'm and grateful. I'm, and I'm, I believe in you. Um, for those listening, uh, y'all won't know the conversations I called Chris in somewhat of a panic when <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't think I'm going to make it through this thing. And so I'm always yeah, right. uh, like, it was reciprocal, right? Yeah. I'm always, I'm just super grateful for our wow. conversations, man. You're an amazing human being and I'm a better person because of your friendship. And I just want to say that publicly, like I believe in you. I mean, more than just like this, you and I know we do this, this whole on air thing. And, and this is for me, isn't it a typical radio hit? This is like spending time with a close friend and someone I believe in 
And I just want to say you're doing the work. You're showing up. I mean, I, I see it in your life, and I'm proud of you. I really am. So. Thank you, brother. Thank Anything you. Let's catch up soon, man, because we've got to figure out what's, what, what's next. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we do. So, hey. Thanks for being here. We're going to put links in the show notes, folks. Uh, Building a Non-Anxious Life. Head there now, wintoday.tv. There's a link for you to buy this book. I'm also going to put links to um, Redefining Anxiety and then Own Your Past. Sorry. Own Your Past. Change Your Future. Change Your Future. How about your this? Do me a favor. So. Text, yep. uh, text me your mailing address, and I'm going to mail you 10 or 15 copies of Redefining Anxiety, and you can just give them away to listeners who reach out to you. Perfect. I will do that. Good yeah, sounds good. So folks, folks, uh, stay tuned. I'll, I'll let you know how to get one of those copies and, uh, and all the things. But brother, thank you for being here today. I'm grateful for you, Chris. Thank you.